myself. Uh, my name is Chris Kaiser. Been coming here about three years now, and Jim asked if I would uh, take a stab at uh, just leaving one of these uh, one of these weeks, and I said sure. I'll talk about a man and his time. So one thing I want to encourage you to do is just act like we're all sitting in the same room together, and we'll be uh, we'll be having a small group in your living room, just like nothing else is going on. So that's one thing as we start talking. I just want you to feel comfortable enough to to go through the book uh, just as I'm going through it with you, like we're sitting there together just talking man to man. So without further ado, this is week four, uh, A Man and His Tom. And the theme that I came up with is what are you doing and what am I doing with my time that's gonna last forever. Uh, what am I doing and have done this past week that is kingdom minded? So there were six, I wrote down a bunch of stats here about time because uh, it's kind of mind blowing if you start to think about it. There are 604,800 seconds, 10,080 minutes, 168 hours, seven days in one week. And of those, uh, people on average spend three hours and 15 minutes. That's uh, 1,365 minutes uh, uh, over 38 days a year uh, only on their phone. So that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, just as a uh, accountability thing, I looked at my usage on my phone this past week and I had an average pickup of 58 times a day I picked up my phone and that average actually goes up if you are um, if you're a teen that goes up to I think uh, 13 hours per week on average <laughs> uh, spent on your phone which is mind-blowing so that's uh, 30, 38 days a year that you spend uh, on your phone. That's a lot. So the question that I started asking myself is, how much time have I spent in God's Word compared to looking at my phone? Because I think uh, if I'm going to start talking about how I spend my time and allocate my resources then I need to start reflecting on myself first, not not looking at other people and saying, man, you're, you're really not getting in the Word every day. I really need to look at myself and say, wow, I, I really need to pick it up. Uh, I, uh, I spent half as much time in the Bible app this past week that I did on using the Internet on my phone. So let's get that out of the way first. So uh, let's just say I have some... Uh, have some work to do, and I hope I'm not alone. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty sobering to start looking at the stats of how you use your time. But uh, that's why we're here. That's why we're talking, and we're hopefully going to dig in and learn how we can uh, we can become uh, we can gain some momentum and get better at uh, being godly men. That's that's really what we're what we're spending our time here on. So, uh, without, without taking too much further time, I want to I dig right in here. Um, so, we'll get in the Word first uh, in Ezekiel. So, if you want to grab a Bible, uh, Ezekiel chapter 22. And while you're doing that, I wanted to give a little, uh, little, back, uh, little back story on what Ezekiel is talking about here. Uh, and if you don't know where Ezekiel is, it's after Lamentations and just before Daniel. So a lot of times when I hear stuff, I'm like, uh, where is that in the Bible? So there's a little, if you're flipping through your Bible, you'll have that you have that as a go by. So uh, Ezekiel is speaking to his people, God's people. Uh, God used Ezekiel to speak to his people in exile in Babylon to remind them of their responsibilities before God, even though they were far from the promised land. So, uh, remember that as I read Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. In, in, in verse 30 it says, I looked for someone among them 
who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. So I would pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down in their own heads all they have done, declares the Sovereign Lord. So, you know, this is a pretty pretty heavy heavy statement here. He He's saying he found no one to stand in the gap. So... God always follows through on his promises, and for generations, God warned his people that his wrath was coming, and he gave a, a final role for here, for Ezekiel to, to tell his people, hey, my wrath is coming, you need to be able to stand up and stand in the gap, and to account and say, I've stood up, and I, I know God, I, I know what my responsibilities are and how that translates to us you know we need to fight passivity um, my generation our generation is one the one of the saddest things is uh, in regards to our call the number of times we have surrendered that call to passivity to our spouses and pass that off to our girlfriends our wives is far too much the roles of manhood have, since I was, you know, maybe six or seven, changed dramatically to now. In relinquishing that call to be a spiritual leader in our families, in our churches, in our communities, um, it's really led to a decline in the demise of our homes and our communities. Second um, Timothy 2.21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So, four points here. Uh, are you available for God? Uh, are you available for the master creator of the universe? Uh, are you really wasting your time sending emails all week? Or are you wasting your time talking about you know, the Super Bowl, or who won the last baseball game, or are you being productive and using your mind for the spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth? And when I say you, I mean myself also. Uh, um, time is a precious gift. It's the only resource that we have that doesn't, uh, is not renewable, right? We can go to work, make more money, and replenish it even if we spend it like crazy you can't get back your time uh, it's it's a finite resource your time here on earth so it's not it's not something to mess around with we all struggle with being good stewards of our time I, I struggle with I mean I just told you <laughs> the stats that I have for this past week are pretty I hesitated to even share that with you it's it's pretty awful um, in your lifetime, uh, you're going to, if you average uh, your 13 hours per week spent on emails, uh, your 7 to 9 hours of sleep, that varies a lot, but you're going to spend, an average life spends 26 years sleeping, 13 years working, 8 years watching TV, and 4 hours eating. So, what's, if you, if you go to a gravesite, you'll see you know, begin date, end date, and there's a dash in between. You already know that there's a certain amount of that dash that's used up for eating, sleeping, and, and we're we're called to provide for our family, so you're going to work. But our, our goal here is not to, just to work. Our goal here is to spread the gospel and spread the good news of Jesus to everybody, firstly, leading our families to that and then our communities our churches stepping up and being leaders in that in our community and saying hey here's what here's who i am here's what i'm about and being unapologetic about it so i, I ask you again do you think you're available uh, i mean i'm asking myself am i available enough when god calls me to do something so, in response to that, I think, you know, 
yes, I have been in the past, but am I currently? Sometimes I stall out. Sometimes I lose momentum. The whole thing here is real momentum, right? So how, how have you potentially lost your momentum? Uh, so in, in the days of convenience right now, we, get, we have so many gadgets and gizmos to you know, save time or save energy, but it really can rob us of sharing intense moments of being able to share the gospel with people instead of picking up the phone and calling someone and asking them, how's your week going? You send them a text message, and if they don't respond, you let it go. That's it. Or you send an email instead of, you know, actually thinking whether someone having a piece of human interaction. I mean, even in an office, uh, I think of an office, sending a little Teams message or having a Zoom call instead of actually walking across the office and talking to someone face to face, letting them see your body language and seeing, hey, this guy, he's different. He's following a different set of ideals than I've seen before. And leaning into that, so people, when people ask, you can tell them, hey, I have a relationship with God. And that's, this is what it's all about. And Unlike, like I said, unlike other resources, time can't be bought, sold, borrowed, or stolen, stocked up, or saved. Um, if we can do, all we can do is use what we have when we have it. And uh, I, I stole this from my wife, Jessie. Uh, she, she's heard this and she repeats it a lot. Sometimes you have to say no to good things so that you can say yes to great things. And that may be, that's really easy to say and a lot harder to put into practice. Uh, You have to slow down and be ruthless to eliminate the hurry in your life, your family's life, the speed at which you're moving, and really focus on the long-range result of, hey, this is the purpose of my life. (laughs) you got to slim down your schedule, which is easier now for some because people aren't as busy now. Not a lot of, uh, I mean, slowly things are popping back up now, filling up that schedule again, filling up your calendar. But you really need to not let yourself get overextended. Examine the things that are extraneous to really your focus on what life should be. You got to sit down. You got to learn to live in the now, live in the present. And most of us, either live in the live for tomorrow or live in the past Um, but our focus should be on what's going on what is God doing right now with us we need to look around Uh, it's not a sin to celebrate what what God's doing in your life right now it's 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 hard sometimes to stop and say wow God has blessed me tremendously for today. It, it's amazing to just look in my life and see all the amazing things that God has done for me. Uh, he's blessed me with a, a wonderful family, and I, I, sometimes I just take that for granted. And you gotta, you gotta look around and and see, and what God has blessed you with. And uh, fifth, you have to. You have to plan in. You don't. You don't have to skip. Yes, if you don't schedule, someone else will. If you don't schedule your life, someone else is going to determine what schedule your life has for you. In James four fourteen, it says, "For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes vanishes away. Having no schedule or desire of being an intentional steward of your time." And living your life off the cuff could leave you handcuffed with energy being wasted on the trivial and not prepared for the eternal. And uh, in the in in Chris's uh, vocabulary, that means, you know, if if you don't have a plan, then you plan to fail. You plan to fail at succeeding in your job as becoming a a real man of God. If you don't have your plans together, then 
Someone else is going to determine them for you. No one ever drifts to God. They always drift away from God. It's intentional. If you think about financial planning, planning of any kind, it takes real intentional focus on planning to do the right things. It's easy to drift and to do nothing and to sit on the couch and waste your time. It's That's easy to do. But planning to step up to the plate and be available, thats that takes work. It's not easy. Uh, second point, are you able? Uh, in second, second Timothy 2.21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and useful for the master. So, <laughs> are you able? Um... Do you have the skill, power, and resources to do something? I think a lot of times the world would tell us, no, we're not able, and puts that uh, that doubt in our mind. But uh, I think we're all able. Uh, you, you're able to be a man of God <laughs> any morning you wake up. That's a choice for you. That's Again, just like you can let someone fill out your schedule, you can let, let someone... The first notification you get on your phone in the day could say you're not adequate, but I, I I would say God has prepared us to be able to step up and be able. So, if you think you're not you're not useful, I would say you're useful to God in any man manner you you can imagine. Everyone is is blessed with some gift, and for God's it's the opportunities are endless so we're going to talk a little more about leadership in this in this section and i think uh, uh walt emerson says what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us so uh, leaders don't point the way they lead the way so that means you're not sitting on the couch uh pointing and saying we should do that what when your wife asks you something or your girlfriend says should we do this you're leading the way and saying absolutely yes let's get in the word together let's start a devotional together let's let's join a small group those are things that you can't just sit back and take the back seat of yeah sure we'll go eventually if we get around to it uh, my dad actually used to carry uh, i don't know if you guys have ever seen him but he, a little round wooden coins that said to it on it so uh, i never really grasped that until i heard a lot of people say yeah i'll do that when i get around to it a little side story there but um real leadership is being a person that others will gladly and confidently follow and that's not something that's easily easily recognized or easily earned i mean respect is is gained not not just expected leaders are always aware of those they are accountable to and those that they are accountable for especially while on the journey so you need to have someone that you're accountable to and know who you're accountable for if if you're a if you're a husband if you're a father it's it's your responsibility to share the gospel with your family uh, if i've been placed in a job or on a construction site or in a in a mechanic shop god's placed me there i'm responsible for sharing the gospel with those people when the opportunities come it it's not like god's sending uh, a missionary to conyers georgia to share the gospel with the people that i work with that's my responsibility god's put me there and he said i'm able to do it and i uh number four here leaders bring energy uh, I tell the the uh, Sunday school class, the high school boys always say, always read the Bible, like monotone and like they don't want to read it. And I tell them they should be reading the Bible and bringing energy when they read the Bible, as if those words are coming straight out of God's mouth directly to them and talking to them. I mean, it's the living, breathing word of God. So. It's your job as a leader of your household to bring that energy of doing the things of 
you know, leading your family to talk to God and read his word with that energy. God didn't make you a leader to respond to stuff all day. He made you a leader to move people. And that that's, you know, it's not, it's not our job to respond to emails all day. It's our job to move people toward knowing him and having a relationship with him. So uh, the third point, adaptable. Are you adaptable? Uh, and uh, in the next, next little section here, there's, there's things that are momentum breakers and momentum makers. And I, I think I said earlier, you know, we all look back and say, man, that, at that point in time, I was really close to God. I was, that, that, was a, that was a mountaintop. And we also can look back and say, mm, that was not so great a time in my life. That was a valley. But I think one of the things we're trying to do here is talk about how we can avoid momentum breakers and maximize the opportunities for momentum-making opportunities. Uh, so adapting, <laughs> the definition of adapt, adapting is being adjusted or becoming adjusting to new or different conditions. Every single morning when you wake up, something new is going on. And I think God has, God has allowed us as men to be adaptable to every different situation. So one thing, uh, momentum, momentum. The first momentum breaker is uh, double mindedness, and the momentum maker is focus. If you have the ability to focus, uh, then you have the ability to lead your family in the direction that God points you. If you let things cause distractions you know, friction to slip in in your, in your relationships, then you can lose focus, and that's super easy to do. Momentum breaker number two, the past. A momentum maker is the future. The past is the past. Everyone's got scars. Everyone has highlights in their life, but the past is behind you, and the future is before you. So no matter what you're doing, you can do something different tomorrow, no matter what your past was. Uh, Individualism is the momentum breaker number three. If you want to kill momentum, insist on doing things by yourself. Uh, in the uh, the last uh, group we did, we talked about uh, the, the the lone lone wolf mentality of trying to do things by yourself, trying to do things on your own, not getting involved with a group of of guys in your life that can really point you and and sharpen you. In the right direction. Um, if if you want to do things by yourself, uh, it's it's not going to work out. You need to have a you need to have teamwork and build a team around you that can build you up and point you toward back toward God. Um, I'm going to break number four, apathy, and the opposite of that, passion. You got to have passion for reading reading your word every day. If you don't have passion for that, then then you need to pray about it, and, and I need to pray about that. Some days that there are fourteen notifications on my phone in the morning before I get in the Word, and I I I have to pray. God, give me peace and tranquility so I can study Your Word before picking up anything else to set out my day. That's that's my. I mean, I have to start my day like that. So much so that I actually put my Bible on top of my, uh, on top of my computer, so that I physically have to move my Bible in the morning <laughs> before I get on the computer. That's how. That's all. That's how much of a momentum shift I have to do each day just to get at that. So momentum breaker number five: dishonesty. And momentum maker. Momentum maker is character. Um. I, a guy in my life, uh, when I was a little bit younger, used to say, "Character is what you do when no one is looking." <laughs> so, um, it's the sum total of your everyday choices, and can't be built or regained overnight. So you have to have good character. Uh, number six, indecision. You have to take action. Momentum makers action. 
Seven, unforgiveness versus forgiveness. If you're if you're not willing to forgive, there's there's no way that you can build uh, build a team. You there's no way you can lift up your wife or your girlfriend. You you have to be able to forgive uh, for that to happen. Um, momentum breaker number eight is anger, and then um, the maker is brokenness. I uh, Jamo Jamo said don't. Uh, don't don't you better not have to uh, to confess before you uh, before you do this, but I I do I'm gonna be brutally honest with you guys uh, I get so angry at and react instead of being proactive during my day sometimes instead of reacting with humility and brokenness that I just lose focus I I'm not able to adapt to what God is the situations God has put me in and I need to I need to do better at that I, there's there's no way around it number nine is pride momentum maker humility I repeat there and number number 10 childishness and the momentum maker biblical manhood uh, childishness I think we can all define what that is and a bib- biblical manhood is Everybody knows examples of of men in the Bible that they need to they need to look to. If you if you don't if you don't have a biblical man in your life to look at, I, I would ask that you you look to you look to Jesus. I mean, there's there's no other person you need to look to, even if you have terrible past memories of of what men in your life look like as examples. Turn to Jesus. Look, look in this book right here. He, he can, he can completely change your life. Momentum breaker number eleven is disobedience, and then maker is obedience. And number twelve, unbelief versus faith. Uh, and then the final point here: Are you acceptable? Um, who or what needs your leadership and Tom as a man of God now until the end of the year? Um, how can you expect to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, when you haven't done well? You've wasted your time away this year. I mean, we're a twelfth of the way through the year already. What have you done for the spread of the gospel this year in our community, globally, to the ends of the earth? What have I done Gosh, man, I need to I need to work on that. But that's why we're virtually sitting in our our living rooms here, talking together about how we can sharpen each other and how we can turn that around. And then final thought here. It's it's often not what needs our time, but who needs our time, and if we're available, if we're able, if we're adaptable, and if we're acceptable. Guys, I. I Thanks for letting me talk to you and uh, hang out with you a little bit. And ho- hopefully we can, we can continue to sharpen each other each and every day. Thanks.